The opening sequence of episode 27 is both just some basic recap, but also our first explicit acknowledgement of the reason why Aaron's squad was isolated. The very first shot we get is Mika in the previous episode saying that, most likely, no one in Aaron's squad is a shifter as they are all currently in the same place, and despite the supposed breachment of the wall, none of them have transformed. Though that is then immediately followed by Armin noting that the rest of their squad was detained over suspicions of harboring more Titan shifters. Something we have talked about ever since the female Titan mission, but is now only being explicitly addressed in the show. So from this point on, every single decision made by Erwin is with the assumption that, even now, there is likely a traitor among the 104th Corps. Only problem is, our scouts are very, very unlucky, so just like with Annie appearing completely out of the blue, before we could actually deal with any of these concrete suspicions, Zeke would be spearheading an entirely independent attack, which obviously throws a spanner in everything we'd be seeing, as we don't even know he exists. And again, this is neatly encompassed with Armin's usual, however very much implying that, even now, we really know next to nothing about what's truly going on here. As for the title of the episode, I'm Home, I think there are two quite straightforward interpretations. Firstly, we of course have Sasha, who returns home, both very literally as well as figuratively. We'll talk about it plenty in the episode itself, so that's where I'll leave that for now. And in a similar vein, we have Connie also returning to his hometown, though with him, things would go very, very differently. And yeah, this too we'll tackle in just a little bit. Moving into the episode itself, we open with everyone being alerted of this new supposed breach. Though importantly, once we jump on over to Aaron's squad, Armin begins to ponder some very, very important questions. With us now being fully aware that there are in fact Titans within the walls, they naturally ask the question of, why would Titans attack a wall housing other Titans? And that is of course when Armin drops the bombshell that, in hindsight, we know to be at the very heart of the Marley mission. They never attacked the wall, they only ever busted open the gates. Just like with the wall titan they discovered by accident, if Marley had attacked the wall itself, you know, it kinda would have started the rumbling. Kinda sorta the direct opposite of what they were trying to achieve. And now that we also have people like Pastor Nick, who are well aware of what lies within the wall and were supposedly trying to keep that safe, Suddenly, all of the attacks from the Colossal happening exclusively at the gates of protruding districts no longer seems like a coincidence. Unfortunately though, the deductions of our glorious bullhead wouldn't really reach anyone else, so they would still set off and survey the entire wall trying to find out whether there's some entry points. But even now, you should already be thinking that, yes, it is a futile task, as if there was a breach, it would only be at the gates. Though in hindsight, we of course know that there was never a breach at all, and the Titans are simply inhabitants of Ragako. And as Armin continues his speculation, he arrives at another very important conclusion regarding Annie's crystallization in the walls. He knows that the walls themselves appear to be completely seamless, there are no joints, no cuts, nothing to indicate that they were ever actually built by someone, and then proposing that it might be the same as Annie's crystal. Something that we can now confirm to be 100% true because it is just a layer of hardening on top of the wall titans themselves. Though yeah, as per usual, it's all of these little scenes where we see people speculate about what's going on, where you can really quickly piece together exactly what's actually happening. We then jump on over to Hanji who is researching the crystal. And yes, before I started this series, I did seriously consider using this frame for the ever infamous overanalyzing scene. So I guess this is what that would have looked like. But okay, my nonsense aside though, there is a whole bunch of things to note right off the bat. First off, obviously Hanji holding the crystal at all is already a point of intrigue, as all Titan matter would normally just steam away. The crystal, on the other hand, appears to be permanent. So with this in mind, we'd soon come to the conclusion that we might be able to use it to plug the walls. Though more importantly, we now know that humans can shift into a Titan form. We know these human shifters can use this hardening. And now we have a wall filled with titans that is covered by that same hardening. So at this point, there is a good argument to be made that the mystery is cracked, the walls were built by another human shifter. And then when you think back to all those mysterious flashbacks we got of Aaron and his father, suddenly all the pieces start fitting together and perhaps there is more to Aaron than we might have thought. Though secondly, and this is a bit of a broader talking point, note that every single thing following this point happens in ridiculously fast succession. Like, for context, the rest of the season literally happens within the space of like 20 to 30-ish hours. Everything from Zeke turning Ragako into Titans, 
to us finding out that Emir is also a Titan, to us confronting Reiner and Bertolt, to Aaron awakening the Founder for the very first time, everything happens within the space of like 12 hours. Not only that, Erwin is still swarmed with questions about what happened in Stoess. So even though, at this point, we would have all the information on Reiner and Bertolt in time for their transformations, Erwin just literally didn't have enough time to make it to the Wall. So just like with the female Titan throwing a huge spanner in their entire plan, the Beast Titan too would triumph in over Erwin's Giga Brain simply because we didn't even know something like that existed. More on this soon though. Another thing that I found really neat was them moving during the nighttime, something that, as we've heard before, is actually far safer. That is, if they were operating under normal circumstances. Normal pure Titans are powered by sunlight, so once night falls, as long as they remain undisturbed, they wouldn't really move around. Though with Zeke's power, he can override that natural instinct and still force them to move. But yeah, the shot of them just disappearing into the night is really, really cool. That said, they all then pack up, with our new best friend Pastor Nick tagging along just for good measure. Obviously, a whole bunch of drama breaks out about why Nick kept quiet all this time, prompting both Aaron and Levi to quickly let him know what they'll do if he doesn't spill the beans. Though Hanji then steps in, saying that they already tried that. Saying that he does seem to be level-headed, but he will happily die for whatever his cause is. And then wondering what might be more important than literally all of the humanity within the walls. In hindsight, we of course know that all of this was just with the belief that the purpose of the walls will be fulfilled. Originally, the walls were constructed as the ultimate form of deterrence. So the wall religion upheld it as such, keeping the true nature of the walls a secret as a form of renouncing that war. To them, as long as no one tried using the power of the walls, no one would attack them. And for Nick, he would uphold that vow even in spite of the events of Shiganshin up, then Trost, and now everything happening in the present day story. As of right now though, I think we yoink him with two different goals. One, with the hope of breaking him when he sees thousands of refugees. And two, to get him away from anyone else who might know about the true nature of the walls and would now be looking to silence our good pal Nick. Do keep in mind that Erwin was already mega sus of everything going on with the MPs. A belief of his that would obviously be validated with Nick's death later on. Though importantly, as much as there is scheming here, a vast majority of what happens after this point is entirely unplanned and almost completely improvised. We then jump on over to Sasha who is making her way back to her hometown, only for us to then fade into a brief flashback. Number one, it is like mega sad for what I think are obvious reasons. Though number two, it makes her whole food obsession running joke not just a gag but an actual in-universe explanation. They lived off the land, and that often resulted in them not being the most well-fed. So once she actually got her hands on food, she savored every second of it. And this too, I think, hits so much different now that we know how the bigger story turns out, as even in a world as cruel as this, she always found joy in these smaller things. Though number three, and this is where it gets mega sad, we actually see that Sasha was kinda not very nice and somewhat ignorant before she joined the recruits with her saying that it's not their fault for someone losing their home, and then adding that they should have just done a better job of protecting them. This of course draws immediate parallels both to the events of this episode, with Sasha now returning home with a now much more level-headed perspective on the world and living up to the hopes of her father, as well as most of the season 4 story, where we'd see this whole situation completely inverted, with Sasha now being among the ones attacking a different nation, which to her father, is just a mistake across the board no matter how you swing it. In that sense, I think Arthur actually turns out to be one of the most damaged characters throughout the series exactly because he lived a simple life with no desire of anything greater. The thing with his beliefs is that eventually they turn out to be 100% true. He says that when push comes to shove, all humans are just pack animals. Exactly like we'd see with the entire world turning their sights on Aaron. But leading up to that point, many of his beliefs are too idealistic and somewhat naive which in turn just comes with a lot of disappointment and pain. Though even in spite, or perhaps even because of that, once he learns that his daughter's killer is the girl he's caring for in the final season, he still takes her in as their own, just like he taught his daughter way, way back. She was protecting her home, just like they were way back when. He can't blame her for that. Yes, she killed his daughter, but again, she was just protecting her home. So as I always say, there is no right side in Attack on Titan, it is just a never-ending cycle of despair. We will talk about this plenty more with the final season, but I think Isayama deliberately wanted every single one of our characters to have blood on their hands. 
So even someone as pure as Sasha did eventually succumb to exactly what her father warned her about. Though those are still not my favorite moments in this. Because he then says that he is ready to set aside tradition and his pride if that means his loved ones just get to live in peace. Which again, is exactly what we see him do in the final season. The moment he has the opportunity to get revenge, he realizes that he is currently at a very, very important crossroads. He can spin that endless wheel of revenge yet again, or he can set aside his personal grief and stop it once and for all. But my absolute favorite line is him saying, you might not want to hear it, but everything in our world is connected. Just as we see this little squirrely boy appear in the corner of the screen. Number one, this actually turns out to be true in a very literal sense, as the paths do literally connect all of their people. But number two, I think it is the perfect summary of the conflict at the very heart of the story. For better or worse, in Attack on Titan's case, that is obviously worse, every single action will be met with a reaction. Something we would see play out countless times throughout the story, with ever-increasing casualties in the process. All that said though, Archer is the absolute goat. We then jump on over to the mid-cars talking about the scattered villages. Which, yeah, is kinda sorta whatever, but importantly, just like in the real world before urbanization became a thing, these scattered villages actually house most of the population. This in turn means that, if this was another full-blown attack from Marley and the walls had indeed been breached, we would ultimately just end up in exactly what Pix has described. People turning on other people just because there are not enough resources to go around. The population of the walls was already completely annihilated with the fall of Walmaria. So now that we only have two walls, well, people are naturally even more concentrated. And so, even a comparatively smaller attack would still result in insurmountable losses simply because civilians have no means of fighting back. In hindsight, it of course also helps explain why a comparatively large number of titans just appeared out of the blue. Even if it was just Ragako, it still housed a decent number of families that could easily pose a sizable threat, or at least a distraction to the walls while Zeke and Pete continue with their mission. Returning to the episode, Sasha makes it home, which to her surprise has grown substantially. So again, people are just far, far more concentrated now, so naturally the villages have just grown in size. Though as she makes it deeper into the town, she notices a titan munching on a mother, with her daughter simply sitting there in shock. And here, we once again get some really interesting mirroring. Because just like Mika's saving Luis back in trust, Sasha saves Kaya, very much living up to the way her father taught her to. Those who cannot protect themselves should be protected, even if they make fun of the way you talk, exactly as Kaya would do in just a few seconds. Though what I find more interesting here is where both Kaya and Luis end up. Because Kaya was taken in by the Browse family and lived what is largely a peaceful life. The trauma no doubt still haunts her, but she was accepted into a loving family and they got by mostly fine. Luis, on the other hand, became so enthralled by Mikasa's power and wanted to pursue it as well, eventually ending up fighting alongside everyone else in the attack on the Barrio. And yes, that pursuit of power, just like with Sasha, would eventually get her killed. But both Mikasa and Sasha were just obviously trying to save a helpless girl. But I think those diverging paths we see them go on very neatly describes exactly what Archer was talking about. If everyone in the story accepted the fact that, at the end of the day, all of them are just people trying to get by, power would have never been something that is worth pursuing and idealizing. And if that were the case, the walls would have never been attacked, there would have been no war for the Titans, Luis wouldn't have died, none of this would have happened. So yeah, again, Attack on Titan, very depressing. That said though, Sasha just apologizes to the woman and leaves behind as both of them run off. Only problem is, their horse also has the same idea and also runs off. And as we already heard during the female titan mission, when it comes to venturing beyond the walls and dealing with titans, losing your horse is effectively a death sentence. So in this situation, where Sasha doesn't have her gear, she doesn't have her horse, and she has a child to look after, things are very, very bleak. Though she then spots the bow, very clearly mirroring the bow we saw in the flashback and her father talking about giving up their ways. Though now much wiser, Sasha accepts the fact that it's not purely black and white. Yes, she left her home and technically left her traditions behind. But it's not just a binary thing, she can still pick up that bow and live just like she did back then. She has changed, sure, but her past is still her own. Something we would also be addressing in just a second from a few other perspectives. Though what is easily the most messed up line here is what Kaya says. Saying, they knew my mom had bad legs. They knew, but no one came to help. 
Which is exactly what Archer was talking about. The question of, is your fellow man worth the trouble? For Sasha, this is essentially her proving that, yes, you may laugh at me, you may not like me, but I will help regardless. Which very neatly ties into the flashback we then drift into with us seeing Amir, Sasha, and Astoria. And oh boy, this scene is just so amusing in retrospect because, like, it's Amir calling out Sasha for speaking stiffly and trying to hide her true past. But the thing is, literally all three of them are liars 24-7. Emir is hiding like 90% of who she is, Sasha is hiding her dialects, and Historia is hiding the little fact that she is their literal queen. So you know, a liar knows a liar, I suppose. But yeah, the whole dynamic of Historia standing up for Sasha, because just like Sasha, she too wants to convey herself as a totally independent person not affected by their roots, while Amir is the complete opposite, and despises the fact that she acted like some false queen for such a long time, just neatly encompasses their stories moving forward. Particularly for Historia and Amir, who'd both come to the forefront in just a few episodes. Returning to the present, though, it is time for Levi to step aside. Because our girl Sasha straight up solos a titan with a flimsy bow and arrow. And as if that wasn't cool enough, she straight up lodges one of said arrows in the titan's eye at melee range. Very much demonstrating both her roots of being able to shoot the bow by taking out the first eye, and then showing her new skills as a trained soldier by fighting very, very up close. Though it's not long until she sees her father, who has already run into Kaya. But to me, I think there's a deeper implied meaning here that he never ran. He was coming back not just because he heard that someone else was left behind, but rather because he was going to actively look for people in trouble. And of course, Papa Brouse is very proud of Sasha because she very much did exactly what he taught her. But this is Attack on Titan, so now that we've had our wholesome moment, let's completely flip the board and do the starkest contrast known to man. Because when Connie returns home, no one is there. No one except what we now know to be his mother. On initial viewing, this of course sparks an entirely new mystery of why is the town deserted? There is not a single drop of blood, all the horses are still there, but the buildings are completely destroyed as if the titans were actively crushing everything in their way. Now we of course know that it was the big monkey who turned Ragako into titans. So unlike Sasha's town, who were mostly safe and sound, Connie's village is now actively being blown to smithereens by our very own cannons. So, yeah. And with that, let us jump right into episode 28, where the opening sequence is easily one of the cheekiest scenes when it comes to the whole Reiner Bertolt reveal. Obviously, Connie is just super distraught, and as is often the case, the great leader Reiner steps in to offer him support. But notice how we immediately linger on Burrito, giving him the old stink eye. Because at this moment, I think he is very, very worried about Reiner's split personality. I think at this point he's thinking, wait, Marley is potentially attacking. We need to figure out what we're doing and whether we need to join them. Reiner, I need you to be a Marley warrior now, not a parody soldier and Connie's buddy. This will obviously become super important in just a few episodes, so hold that thought for now. And another thing to note is Connie thinking that he heard his mother say, welcome home. Which, like, number one, whoever titled these episodes I'm Home for Sasha reuniting with her father, and then Welcome Home for Connie realizing his entire village is dead is just cruel. But number two, it brings up the ever-interesting question of, did he imagine it? Well here, we once again have to take a quick stroll on over to the OVAs, because no, the answer isn't actually as simple as you might think. In the Isles Notebook OVA, which, by the way, will also be super important for Hanji recognizing the name of Amir, so yes, it is very much canon, but there we saw a member of the Amir cult who was turned into a Titan alongside the then-discovered fake Amir. But the thing with her Titan is that it was a pure Titan that could somehow speak. Whether it was through sheer devotion or something like that, she literally walks up to Isle and speaks, describing herself as a subject of Amir. And yes, her name could also technically be pronounced as Ilse, but I have no idea how you actually pronounce it, so we'll just leave it at that. Though she then would literally pull her face apart in what I think was meant to be a sign of resistance against the Titan form, and then moments later, she snatches Isle up, but does not eat her. Instead, after Isle dies, the Titan stores her corpse in a hollow tree, seemingly to show respect and perhaps to apologize. So yes, in canon, we do have a pure titan that can resist the primal titan urges of eating humans, it depicts very explicit intelligence, and it can audibly speak. 
Later, Hanji and the other scouts would find the notebook with details of this encounter, which would also bleed into a few other things we'll get to later on. But point is, there has been a Titan who can speak and possesses human intelligence as a pure Titan. As to why this is possible, it's anyone's guess really. You can of course raise the usual Attack on Titan questions as to which bloodline they belong to, maybe they were injected with a particular Titan spinal fluid, maybe they weren't injected with enough spinal fluid and so their transformation was sort of 50-50. I think all of these are reasonable guesses and big surprise, it's exactly what we'll be doing with the Rod Ross Titan as well. But realistically, I think even knowing this, it's really up to you to decide whether or not Connie imagines it or if she actually speaks. Just note that the notebook with descriptions of this talking titan are canon, so it's not just a one-time anomaly. As for the title of the episode, get ready, this one's very complex, Southwestward. You know why it's called that? Because they ride Southwest. Yes. Moving into the episode itself though, we see the scouts go on their long, long journey trying to locate the breach. One that is of course not even there. We first pick up with Astoria and Emir, where Emir's dedication and love for Astoria is really beginning to show itself. With Astoria, or Krista since her identity is still not revealed, just asking why Emir is doing all of this. Again, this whole living for someone else versus living for yourself debate will become very very important throughout this arc, particularly when we get to the whole Utgard castle where everything blows up in spectacular fashion, so as of right now, he's just planting those seeds. And also, I think it can also be seen as another case of mirroring those core relationships we see with the likes of Eren and Mikasa. With Mikasa too being ready to sacrifice anything and everything for Eren, but unlike Historia, who would accept her past and open herself up to Emir, Eren would rather choose to confront it very explicitly and push Mikasa away. We then cut on over to the Eastern Defensive Line, where we do in fact see that things have gotten very dire and that even people like Worman are now actively working on the front lines. And also, Rico too notes that all of this seems very, very strange. Which is then directly continued as we cut to Hannes, who too says that they should have found something by now and that this doesn't make any sense. And man, do I love how they use music to convey that uneasiness. <laughs> That ever-shifting hum combined with the occasional piano really sells that uncertainty and horror of the situation, with us yet again grappling with something that just plain should not be possible. And that sense is even further strengthened as we cut to now 11 hours after the original sighting. Yet even now, with the sun down and them being in the dead of night, no one has seen a thing. First off, and yes this is somewhat tropey, but I love how this first part of the season is structured as we slowly move toward these stages of investigation. I've mentioned it before already, but Attack on Titan was always one of those series that wasn't scared to leave the main cast for often prolonged periods of time to focus on the world itself. Which I think also allowed for even more intense climaxes as we see the stories ultimately converge from multiple angles. And so with this whole 8 hours after the original sighting, 11 hours after the original sighting and so on, it just slowly builds up that uneasiness of what is going on. And in a similar vein, I also love how this initial lead up to the big titans clashing arc also introduces an entirely new form of fear. One that is largely hinged on simply the unknown. In hindsight, we of course know that it's as simple as Zeke just turning people into titans. But on initial viewing, I was always taken aback by just how well Isayama kept up the horror of the titans without ever having any titans around. Right now, it's not really the titans themselves or even titan shifters that are the focus. Rather, it is the fundamental question of how. If there is no breach, there simply should not be any titans to begin with. And so now, we have this completely unknown variable of what if they are literally just appearing? Which naturally flips the board completely upside down as all that strategy we used to win in trust seemingly goes right out of the window. I mean, what point is kiting titans to a certain position if they just randomly respawn, right? And I think that is also perfectly conveyed in a purely visual sense, with the scouts literally being these small glimmering lights in the all-enthralling darkness. Both literally and figuratively, we are in the dark as to what is truly going on here. We then jump on over to the mid cards, giving us what is easily one of the most important pieces of information in the entire story of Attack on Titan. Combining a stick and a piece of coal or charcoal will give you four torches. Okay, my haha -ha funnies aside, they just give us a bit of practical insight about why they use torches rather than something like lanterns, which might seem like the safer pick. Returning to the episode though, we see Levi ask, why is Hanji so obsessed with the rock? 
their minerals. And here, we see Hanji explain exactly what Armin was already hypothesizing before. The permanence of the Titan hardening, as opposed to the Titans themselves that steam away, could be used in plugging up the walls quickly with a material just as durable as the walls themselves. Though the more interesting part to this is past Chernik, who seems quite shook. Which I think is just him being a little taken aback by just how quickly they put the pieces together, and how close they are already to figuring out the truth of how the walls were built. Especially considering that Nick also knows about Astoria. Someone, he's explicitly been told, is very important in the whole Wall and Titan mysteries. And on top of all of that, with him also now being in the hands of the scouts, he's probably also looking over his shoulder for some not-so-friendly MPs who might try to silence him, just like the dude who got a little carried away while listening to Diggy Diggy Hold. So to him, this entire little road trip they go on, combined with Hanji's research, combined with Eren's Titan status, combined with the capture of Annie and the revelation of Titans within the walls, literally his entire duty of keeping these secrets is very quickly crumbling away, which naturally makes her newest best buddy very, very shook. And again, we have this little bit of added dialogue to remind us of what all of this is truly about, with Eren once again just so happening to mention the key very explicitly telling us that, yes, all the answers to literally all of this exist within the basements. As we make it to Ermic, though, and I have no idea how I actually pronounce it, please don't at me, we see the waves and waves of refugees make it into the district. Being the little slimy boy that he is, Nick tries looking away in his usual ignorance is bliss fashion. Though Levi is there to stop him, telling him, no, take a good look. This is what happens when the walls falls. If we don't figure this out, humanity will be united. United in death. And here, we once again have that clash in ideals and beliefs and the reality of the situation. Because yes, on paper, Nick is not wrong about what he believes and says. No single person or even group of people should possess the true strength of the walls and the rumbling. Something that, somewhat ironically, he is proven to be completely right about with Aaron literally making this decision completely alone. So as much as keeping these secrets might seem like the right call, the reality of the situation is that it is currently getting countless people killed and only strengthening the scouts' resolve to figure out the truth by any means necessary. And that's not even mentioning the entirely external force trying to wipe them out as we speak, clearly showing that the deterrence factors of the walls doesn't really seem to be working now, is it? Though saying that, as much as he's not willing to give up any concrete facts and explanations about the walls, he does say one thing. Krista, or as we now know Astoria, the girl who constantly hangs around Emir, might be able to tell them things that even the wall religion is unaware of. Do keep in mind that even though Rod is yet unaware that Aaron possesses the Founding Titan, they are still making an active effort to ensure that at any given moment they can yoink both Astoria and whoever possesses the Founder. Though even aside from the Historia reveal, this is also where Hanji recognizes the name Emir, which, like I mentioned before, is a direct reference to the notebook which also referenced them as subjects of Emir. And just like we talked about last time with the Season 2 ending, here you can wrap yourself up in tinfoil because, I mean, in Norse mythology, Emir is literally what the world is made of. So now that we already have these subjects of Emir and fake deities in Emir, you can already begin to ponder just what might be that stomping wall we see in the ending. But okay, returning to the story, here I know a few people have asked, how is it that we are only now noticing Amir's name? And to me, the answer is actually super straightforward. Hanji was really the only one obsessed with Titan research and poured over the notebook. So it's as simple as literally no one else having read these mentions of Amir. And at the same time, because they were so focused on their own research and scout duties, they just never had the time to pay attention to something as trivial as personal files of all the recruits. Just like up until now, they hadn't tried investigating the origins of the recruits simply because it is largely a waste of time. I mean, keep in mind, us having Titans among us is kind of a first. Though this also nicely leads us into the other piece of information that Sasha brings. The personal files on Burrito, Reiner, and Annie. So yes, at this very moment, we are a solid 90% certain that Reiner, Bertolt, or potentially both are Titan Shifters, as now both Erwin's original plan of luring out them all through falsified plans and their personal backgrounds both line up. Though again, because Reiner chose to break their cover himself for reasons I won't get into just yet for the sake of time, we just simply wouldn't have enough time to set up another mission to capture them, and eventually it would all just come down to the chase. 
And also, just like with the ODM gear in Annie, some say that this isn't a good way to write a mystery as we never saw the records themselves and therefore could never make this conclusion. But exactly as I said with the ODM gear, I think this is more so the final nail in the coffin and a in-universe confirmation for their suspicions. I think we already had more than enough evidence leading up to this point to conclude that Reiner, at least, is a very, very sussy boy. But yeah, if you want to think about it, technically, if Reiner didn't break their cover, at this very moment, Erwin is cooking up another big brain plan to get both of them at once. Though he also still doesn't know about Burrito's nuke ability, so maybe that too would have fallen flat. But point is, everything following this point just simply moves too fast for us to set up something like that. Also, Armin sharing the very valuable information that Historia has long blonde hair and that she is cute, only for us to then smash cut to her napping, really gives me the giggles. But hey, I guess it's just a rare moment of wholesomeness. Though the last thing we see in this episode is basically the first major turning point in this arc. The scout teams make it to Utgard Castle, the place where Zeke and the Marlians made camp before the attack. As of right now, we only get glimpses of this, so we'll tackle this with the proper flashback we get later on. But Reiner, of course, notices that Amir can read the Marlian writing, obviously revealing that she is not from Paradis. The can itself is also a dead giveaway of more advanced technology, as Paradis hasn't discovered anything close to canning themselves. There's also the fact that the can says herring, a saltwater fish that simply can't be caught in parody since the walls are landlocked. But yeah, in literally like 5 seconds, their entire dynamic just takes a complete 180. There's also the fact that the Titans begin swarming the tower, something that, just like Harmon mentioned in this very episode, simply shouldn't be possible if there were normal pure Titans. Though the biggest thing here is obviously Reiner and Berthold noticing Zeke. And yes, this might be me leveraging hindsight a little too much, but I genuinely think that even the others notice just how stunned the Marley duo is. Because I mean, yeah, this is a shock. This is either some completely new type of abnormal, or as we now actually know, another shifter. But to Reiner and Berthold, this is a sign of a Marley attack more than anything else, and to them, that means switching sides right now. And also, what is a classic case of me titularly overanalyzing, I do think there's a case to be made that what we see here is also some very deliberate contrasting. The scouts all drop from the tower in their fight against the titans, while Zeke calmly ascends up the wall, revealing just how much of an upper hand Marley has yet again. And with that, we jump on over to Levi and Hanji, where we get some very, very important scenes that, in hindsight, makes you ask many a new question. We see them split up and announce that they'll be riding for Utgard, as that would give them a clear view of the wall. And yes, I know, spooky CGI is back. But I think the shot of the formation riding into the night is actually really, really cool. But that's beside the point. Note how Levi says, Armin, you and Hanji need to pull your brains to figure something out. Mikasa, just protect Aaron, and Aaron, learn some restraints. Note that at this point, they already know of Reiner and Berthold's backgrounds. So that then makes me wonder whether these lines from Levi are in fact already referring to a work in progress plan to capture both of them with him explicitly telling Eren to keep his cool and not try some Titan vs Titan showdown right away. At this very moment, I think Levi's thinking, if we see both of them, okay, we can at least dismiss some of those suspicions since they are not transformed. But then we either let Armin and Hanji figure stuff out, or we simply wait for Erwin. We do not fight them right away. Only problem is, that wouldn't really go according to plan. That said, those are episodes 27 and 28, or seasons 2, episode 2 and 3. Which, by the way, can we please agree on some sort of universal episode notation? Like, season 4, part 3, second half, episode 1 just sounds mega odd. But okay, my silly ramblings aside, from this point on, we are moving right into a whole bunch of Marley lore. So, I hope to see you back as we deconstruct all the Zeke shenanigans at Utgard, the true origins of Amir, and generally nerd out as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Another packed one, but oh boy am I excited for the Utgard stuff next time. Still just boggles my mind how like 5 seconds of completely off-topic dialogue can just break the world of the story itself. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Guy Incognito and Genii, Genia Zarander. I'm so sorry if I butchered the name. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. 
And also, I normally don't want to get like super sappy, and I mean, it's just a number, it doesn't really mean anything. But the previous video of Attack on Titan hit a hundred thousand views in like five days, which is just ridiculous. So seriously, considering this was never meant to be a series originally, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!